they were committing their crimes. And almost all of us carry cell phones. So that's been an advantage for investigators. They're also able to find out a lot by looking at somebody's uh, records on their computer. They can see what their searches were. It's been a really good step for law enforcement. Well, I think that now investigators don't really have to leave their office much to investigate a crime of this nature. If they're doing a forensic digital work, then they can do it from their desk. But there's still quite a bit of footwork for most of them because they still have to get out and talk to people. I do have a question. Another thing that I couldn't help but think reading this. Do you think that in some ways that the, I don't want to say the police messed up because I don't think they did, but that things slipped through the cracks with this that should have been brought to light? It seems like this victim was, it should have been solved sooner. You would think that her mother knew that something was wrong. She knew something had happened to her daughter. The first place she approached didn't believe her. You can't really blame them because people go missing every day and they're usually fine. I think they did the best they could with the information they had. So I don't think that the first group of detectives made major mistakes based on what they knew. It's just that the second group that came in was brilliant, but they had to work overtime in order to solve the crime. They couldn't have done it unless they worked hundreds of extra hours. Well, I would have thought if Tracy went missing and sent notes and didn't want to see the family anymore. I'd be out there (laughs) digging up something trying to find her. Yeah, very frustrating for Carrie's family because they knew something wasn't right. They didn't know what had happened either. They couldn't be absolutely certain that Carrie wasn't the one texting them. They felt it wasn't her, but they couldn't be absolutely certain of that. But even the boyfriend, he didn't know the parents. The parents didn't know him. Right. It was very difficult, and nobody would have expected the killer would go to the extreme she did. She sent over 20,000 emails and texts in the name of her victim. She impersonated her victim and sent that many. That confused people. Nobody was expecting that. Of course not. This book takes Hell Has No Fury like a woman scorn to a whole new level. What do you feel the difference between men and women when it comes to deadly obsession? I think that in general, the females tend to be more vicious and they're sneakier. I think that they can be more dangerous because we're not expecting them to be dangerous. And that's how they get the advantage, especially if it's a male investigator. And now this is something my mom always said. Female sociopaths can more easily fool males and male sociopaths can more easily fool females. So it was pretty easy, I think, for some of these females who killed to pull the wool over the eyes of investigators. They're just not expecting it. Well, I agree with you 100%. I think I've worked with men and women in my career, and I always say I enjoy working with a man more because when they tell you something, they just tell you. But a woman, she weaves things. (laughs) Yeah, and it depends on the person, too. I love meeting people of all kinds, and I've met really, really nice females, really, really nice males. But I've also met jerks, you know, both men and women. Absolutely. Yeah, they're out there. (laughs) (laughs) This woman, I mean, my mouth was hanging open as I was reading some of the things that she did. I mean, it wasn't like she was with this guy for years. She had only been out with him for a short period of time. Well, it just goes to show you how sick of a human being she really is. Well, she was obsessed, and I think it really boiled down to her wanting what she couldn't have. The more a man rejected her, the more she wanted him. Right after Carrie disappeared, he got a note supposedly from her to move in, and he said, nope. You would think she would say, okay, well, he doesn't care about her enough. He loves me or whatever. It's just very confusing. I think the predator, that was her trick. She confused people. She impersonated a number of people and sent out a lot of fake emails. And she managed to get away with her crimes for a long time because of that. I was watching a YouTube video about the case. And she still hasn't admitted she did anything. Oh, no, she's still blaming Amy. Oh, yeah. And Amy is the sweetest person in the world. She's just a (laughs) kind-hearted, gentle person. Nobody who knew Amy believed killer stories. And you did a bang-up job. Thank you. I mean, 
it just really grabbed me when I started reading. And I, I read it in like a day and a half because I couldn't put it down. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. I was very fortunate that people were so open with me and shared such personal things. Some of the things people told me, I was surprised. I'd say, well, can I put that in the book? And, oh, yeah, sure, go ahead. They'd say, I was so excited because I got some really juicy stuff. Well, can you give us your website so people can find you and your books? It's authorlesslyrule.com. Are you working on any new books other than your children's book? I've got lots of ideas. I'm not in the middle of working on a manuscript right now. I'm kind of taking a break. Yeah, after this one, I guess you need a little break. I think so. How long did it take you to research this book? Well, I was researching all the way through, but the whole process of researching and writing was about a year and a half. Wow. I made three trips to Omaha to interview people. Did you talk to Shanna? No, but I wrote to her and she wrote back. She said it wouldn't be good for me to have a book out there right now because I'm trying to prove my innocence so I can get out of here. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Well, you know, I knew that as a journalist, I had to reach out to her. I wasn't sure that I wanted to talk to her, you know, from a human being standpoint. I would have. She'd said yes. I would have gone there and heard what she had to say. But I was not disappointed when she didn't want to talk about it. And so I, this is another thing my mom always said. To find out about a sociopath, you don't go to them. You go to all the people who are around them because they'll tell you who that person really is. Because the sociopath is not going to tell you the truth anyway. That's true. Very true. You know, I have to ask, did you actually meet Ted Bundy? I did meet him. I was 14. And my mom was working at the crisis clinic in Seattle. It was a suicide hotline that she volunteered on because her younger brother had committed suicide. It was 1972, June. That night, the Rolling Stones were playing at the Seattle Coliseum. My two best friends and I went to the concert. My mom didn't think that it was safe for us to wait for the bus afterward. So she was in the middle of her shift with Ted but she came down to pick us up and bring us back to the crisis clinic where we would be safe with her and Ted Bundy. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and I remember we walked in and my mom introduced us. I was struck by the fact that he would not look me in the eye. He ducked his head and we were cute little 14 year old girls and he was a young man in his early 20s and we were used to guys flirting with us and looking in the eye and he didn't do any of that he just wouldn't even look he just hung his head and my two friends went on and on all night about how cute he was and how they were so impressed with him i remember i felt left out because i didn't see it and i remember thinking what's wrong with me why can't i see what they're seeing I didn't think he was scary, but I thought there was something off about him. Huh. Very, yeah. very cool. Perceptive. <laughs> well, and it could have just been the fact that he had really short hair, and it was 1972, and I like boys with long hair, and might have been something as shallow as that, mm -hmm. and the fact he wouldn't look me in the eye. So I don't know if it was being really perceptive or just being a shallow 14-year-old. <laughs> what did you think when he was arrested? Did you believe it, or...? Well, I saw this whole thing unfold through my mom's eyes. It was a Sunday and the Seattle Times had done this big feature about these two girls who had vanished the week before from Lake Sammamish State Park. And there was this giant spread and pictures of the missing girls and a composite drawing of a man named Ted. The witnesses had overheard him talking to one of the girls and he introduced himself as Ted. So it said Ted under the composite drawing. And I remember my mom walking in and saying, my sister and I were sitting on the couch. She had the paper open and she was staring at it. And as she walked and she said, girls, this looks like my friend Ted. Wow. My sister kind of scoffed and, oh, you know, come on. That's ridiculous. I wondered. Huh. I didn't know how it was going to turn out. Right. I, I was just watching my mom and she was pretty shocked. Well, I have to say, I just got chills. <laughs> yeah. Just the fact that you were in the same room with him is, oh. Now, did your sister follow in your mother's footsteps? No, she's a very good writer, but she didn't really have any interest in being an author. Leslie, we thank you so much for talking. We were big fans of your mother's, and you have 
definitely filled a void. And please keep us posted if you write any more true crime books. Oh, I, I sure will. It was fun talking to you. And you enjoy the rest of your day or evening. What okay. <laughs> Thanks so All right. Too. Thanks, Leslie. Bye-bye. I really enjoyed Leslie's book. It was very, very informative and very, very scary. Absolutely. In looking up some stuff on Leslie, I was very impressed that her sensitivity towards the victims, she learned that obviously through the influence of her mother. When she was first approaching writing this book, she actually checked with Nancy Rainey who was the mother of Carrie Farver. Mm -hmm. And she told her that she would only write this book if it would help her heal. I think that's wonderful. It just goes to show you that this was not about sensationalism. And apparently also, she learned some secrets, but they were hurtful, so she kept those out. Well, the Foster family that raised Liz or Shanna, they said that they knew the truth of what happened, but they wouldn't talk. So I wonder if it's got anything to do with that. But if it's hurtful, then I guess we're better off not knowing. Such a story. Every person who's tempted to meet a stranger online should read this book first. Isn't that how you met your husband? Yes. Yes, it is. And it's how you met yours. That's right. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a cautionary tale. If it sounds too good to be true. Well, there's also something. If somebody falls in love with you really, really fast, run the other way. Definitely. Well, she obviously had a lot of other issues. Once she latched on to somebody, she wasn't going to let go or let them let go let it go on and on. He kept telling her, no, I don't want to see you anymore. Then, you know, a month later, he fed into her obsession. He thinks that females are the gentler sex. I've always said women are much more deadlier than men are. And I think part of it is if they're scorned, they just take it too far. I looked up some statistics and in 2019, there were 10,355 murder offenders in the United States. And out of those, there was 1,408 females, which, you know what? Males were seven more than the females, but there were 4,502 that go unsolved. And I have to ask myself, hmm, I bet you that amount of females is a lot higher. <laughs> might not be smarter. And being a woman, I'm telling on us all, we're sneakier. Oh, definitely. Oh, we're nasty people. <laughs> we really are. <laughs> not all of us. Well, when we're wronged. She's an excellent writer. And of course, she has quite a few novels, the ghost stories that she's written, the paranormal. So she has a background in writing, and she's a very good writer. Somebody asked her, would she tackle more true crime? And she said, if the Tangled Web was well received, well, I think based on what I'm seeing, we will be seeing a lot more of Leslie's true crime writing. I hope so. I was a big fan of her mother's. I plan to finish reading some of Leslie's that I haven't gotten to yet. Yeah, I like ghost stories, so I would try those as well. But I thought this was an interesting case for her to cover as her first case. I think it was a very good story with all the technical aspects to it and the social media. It's yes, very it timely. Is. Yes, definitely. Written for the, I guess... Today's dating public. Well, that wraps up our visit with Leslie. We thank her for visiting with us, and we hope you check out all of Leslie Rule's books and Anne Rule's books if you haven't read any of those. My new and noteworthy book is The Woman Who Stole Vermeer The True Story of Rose Dugdale and the Rustboro House. Art Heist. It is by Anthony Amore. It is published by Pegasus Crime. It comes out November 10th.
It is the extraordinary life and crimes of an heiress turned revolution.